have been stabbed, shot, poisoned, frozen, hung, electrocuted, and burned. Oh, really? And every morning I wake up without a scratch on me, not a dent in the fender, I am an immortal. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where this week we are continuing our loop as we go back to Punxsutawney Phil and Groundhog Day. My name is Steve Morris. I am a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Hello, everyone. My name is John Roca. I'm a writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, California, and a voiceover artist, and really excited to be jumping back into part one of uh of ground, i mean part two of groundhog day no we could just uh, start over at part one i mean if that's what you want to do, say, just go back to the beginning people were commenting that we should start part two as part one as a funny little shout out to groundhog day and i was like that'd be funny and that'd be great but we might, people might get pissed because they might not listen past the point where we realize we're repeating ourselves but yeah i'm excited to be jumping back into this movie and it was great to see because this is one of those episodes we recorded and then people we put it up and now we're coming back to do part two. People have been really positive about us tackling this movie and you and I weren't sure if we were going to talk about this one. So I'm glad we did and I'm glad we placed it where we placed it. People seem really happy with us discuss, uh, uh, breaking down the film. It is a beloved movie. I mean, yeah. it really, it's really yeah. so, – it's so funny. We, you know, there's certain movies we talk about where it's like, well, this is a great film. Yeah. And there are other ones – and I'm not saying like something like Shawshank Redemption isn't a great film. I sure. think it totally is, but it is a beloved film. Yeah. You know, Princess Bride is a beloved. There are these films that are touchstones in people's lives yeah. in ways that, you know, I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but in ways that lots of great films are not necessarily ones that the family comes back to all the time. Right, right. Like you're not coming back to watch Schindler's List all the time. I don't know. 1978 Superman. Absolutely. You know, yeah. so the, you're right. There are certain films that, people have and it's like like anything viral it's you can't explain it it just is and with groundhog day we could come up with all the reasons why but it's something just instinctual within human beings where they in mass just gravitate to a film because for whatever reasons combined or separate or singular that it it just touches them it, it it's something that sparks that favorite feeling within them um and groundhog day is certainly one of those brother you know what just occurred to me, and maybe this is a topic for a cinephile short, which Here you can get on if you subscribe on patreon.com slash the cinephiles. But I was thinking about how dark this movie gets. And I went, mm. and then I was thinking, because I had mentioned Shawshank, and then my first thought was, well, Shawshank is so hopeful. And then I went, no, Shawshank is really dark. Yeah. And then I thought about our conversation about It's a Wonderful Life, which is a hopeful movie, mm -hmm. but it's also really dark. Like, yeah. a, like I think part of what the, the hope works because of the darkness of course you can't have hopefulness you can't have hopeful movie without darkness you have to have the darkness right even rocky you could argue has the darkness right oh, yeah he's, he's coming from a shitty existence arguably he does love this woman but he doesn't know if he's going to be able to break through her shy walls he's got an um a violent antagonistic friend he you know he's breaking legs to make money he's a he's a palooka and this opportunity comes to him and he rejects it because he feels he isn't worth it. And then mm. spends all this time trying to build himself back up to just be able to last the, the, the fight. And so at the end, that's all he really wanted to do was to go the distance. And so it's, it's a great thing, but you have to go through all this darkness, confronting Mickey, confronting the issues yeah. with his father, which if you watch the slide documentary is a real element of his life. And all of that, you have to go through that for him to come out the other side. Um, and it's a it's a metaphor for life. You have to go through the darkness to find the hope, um, unfortunately. You know, it's funny. You and I were just talking off mic about yeah. something that happened that was in your life that was kind of dark. Yeah. And then what your response to it was you said, I got this thing, which was upsetting. Yeah. And then you sent me a hilarious video <laughs> of Eric Idle um you know yeah and, and it's like that is you you literally man manifested what we're talking about is you went yeah. through the dark to find the hope you yeah. know yeah. and to find the humor i think those of us who've been to the darkness and climbed out of it we know how dangerous the darkness can be so if your tools are in place 
you can find your way out of it. And so I think that's that makes us uniquely experienced enough to um, confront certain things and if we're in a good place and navigate our way out of it, even though we sense those feelings. Um, and right. so thankfully that was one of those moments for sure. Well, and we're going into the same moment in the movie because where we left off, we had seen him first be upset about what he was doing, then realize he could do anything. And we saw him do all of these crazy things, uh, robbing people, seducing women, all the stuff that he was doing to have fun. And then he applied all of that to the one thing that he truly wants, which is that Phil is in love with Rita. And so he time after time works on hones perfects the perfect date with her yeah and it fails yeah and it fails worse and worse and worse as he becomes more and more desperate and more and more false until finally we end up with her repeatedly slapping him in the slap montage and i don't even know do we i mean like we we talked about how long has he been in this world i don't know how many times he got slapped by rita yeah right Right. And, you know, because every time it's a new attempt and that we're just seeing the montage that fits within the limited amount of right. time we could have in the movie, which is an hour and 40 something minutes. But as we've spoken about many times, this has been going on for years, years and so, years. Yeah. How many separate ways has he been slapped and how many separate locations in the town has he been slapped? Um, and what was the severity of each slap? He has probably experienced every possible percentile um, of slapping that he can uh, receive from her, for all, from 0.0001 to 99.99 to 100%, you know? And now he's back at Gobbler's Knob again, just looking absolutely wrecked. And then we cut to the absolutely huge version of the alarm clock as 559 slowly teeters over to the sound of thunder to 6 a.m. I think that's a great shot. I think so many people posted it on our Facebook page. Yeah. So clearly they feel the same way about that shot for sure. And now you mentioned the, you know, the stages of grief and now we're in depression. Yeah. Um, fully depression. And you see him <laughs> watching Jeopardy in his pajamas, eating popcorn, knowing all the answers or all the questions before the clue is given. Again, just like with the slap. We probably are only getting a small amount of the actual days, weeks, months, and years of depression he went through um, in this situation before things started to click for him and he could figure out how to find his way out. I mean, the more I think about it, this punishment, this yeah. curse is terrible. I mean, no way out forever. Yeah. And nobody remembers anything that happened the next day. So it's impossible to form any relationships to any real human connection. It's all going to get erased, everything that happens, and you start over in the same place. Ugh, it's absolutely brutal. And and some of that comes out in his next report on, the, on Gobbler's Knob because he says, A thousand people freezing their butts off waiting to worship a rat. What a hype. Probably like they used to mean something in this town. They used to pull the hog out and they used to eat it. You're hypocrites. <laughs> Which, by the way, apparently there's some truth to this. Oh, really? Oh. Because Groundhog Day started as a groundhog hunt. Yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. I'll give you a winter prediction. It's going to be cold. It's going to be gray. And it's going to last you the rest of your life. And if that report was bad, how about this one? Once again, the eyes of the nation have turned here to this tiny village in Western Pennsylvania, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I mean, if you want to analyze, well, we do, it's the show. But in this section of the film, the depression is not just because she's rejected him. The depression is her rejection has made him even more aware of how you, how useless he thinks what he does is. You know, he already was doing it kind of like, how can I say this, sleepwalking through it in the beginning of the movie. Like, it's so easy for him what he's doing. And he has to make up that idea, make up that lie that, you know, a bigger network has been calling him, um, which I believe is a lie. And you asked me about that in the first part. And so now with her rejecting him in the way that she did, and as we said, multiple, multiple times, um, over many, probably many years, um, now is the despondency of, wow, look how pathetic my life is. 
not only is the girl that I actually really care about rejecting me, her rejection is making me look at my life and my life is shit. And so these are the things that he's going through, which is going to lead to, as we're going to talk about his attempts, uh, at, well, his successful attempts at suicide that are multiple throughout the whole movie, no, throughout the section of that movie. There's, <laughs> I'm going to put this in a very strange way, <laughs> but um, you, I, I really think at a certain point you can only eat so many cheeseburgers. Mm. And here's mm. what I mean by this is that at the beginning he was happy when he realized I have no consequences. Right. Cause he could indulge every single thing he's ever wanted to do. And in the end that's eventually empty, you know? And then, cause as I said, you can only eat so many cheeseburgers. It's after a certain point, it's just another cheeseburger yeah. and you've already had it many, many, many times. And then this is my own psychology. Of course, we're really talking about with the cheeseburgers, but and then he looks at the one thing he wants and he can't get that. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's really, really sad. And he doesn't know how. I think that's what adds to the depression too, uh, uh, Steve. And I think that's what adds to the depression for a lot of people. I haven't gone through it myself and I know you, you've had moments. It, it's this thing of like, I, I, I don't know how to get the thing I want to get, which is either out of this depression or – um, the, achieve the thing that I want to achieve that I think is going to make me happier in my life, right? And so you go through that because he doesn't have the tools yet. He hasn't learned how to do it yet. And because of that, it adds even more weight to the depression. And that's why he makes fun of everything and scoffs at everything and tries to destroy everything or, or uh, how can I belittle everything because he has no concept of how to be able to sit in a place of not knowing and trust that the answer will come. And so it's it's interesting to watch that as as the film goes on with him and his depression. I'm glad we're having this conversation now because because uh, you've really given me a lot to think about. And I think the the thought that just occurred to me mm. is, oh, he was already depressed. He was oh, depressed yeah. when we met him. Oh, yes. is that he was a deeply unhappy person, but because of the way the world was, he wasn't ever face to face with his unhappiness right. and what, and, and he gave the cause of his unhappiness, everything else in the world that isn't him. It's all the things that he's oh. not getting that he should get. It's all the, you know, and what he doesn't have is any relationships with anybody else. He never, you know, he doesn't get, you know, it, it's funny. We always come back to Citizen Kane and, you know, he wants love on his terms, but he just didn't have any to give. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's Phil Connors, too, is that everything he's tried to do has been on his terms yeah. and it's made him miserable. And now all, all of the ways that he could hide from his depression have been stripped away and yeah. all he's left with is himself, you know? Yeah. Because and, he's in a weird way. He's in a universe entirely alone. He's yes. totally by himself. Here. Yes. But isn't this how like Wells and other people have described their existence? geniuses have described their existence that they feel in essence alone because they are so intelligent that they have no commonality with anybody which leads to um a solitary existence right and some indulge in the judgment and condescension because they're frustrated that people can't meet them at their level but a solitary existence like phil's is is horrific because like you said we know from the beginning he's already a depressed guy. I mean, if you got to lie about people wanting to you to work for them, um, that's that's already saying how unhappy you are with your life. That you have to fabricate this stuff. And this goes back to what uh, what I was saying in the first part. Danny Rubin, when I'd mentioned and you had talked about it as well, Steve, that pe people had reached out to Danny to talk about the philosophy within the movie. You know, like um, rabbis, priests, philosophers, scientists, all these people. Theor uh, is it theoreticists or theoreticians, whatever it is, they all reached out to him to talk to him about the movie. Here's a perfect example of that, right? Because what's the thing that they uh, that a lot of Buddhists and all the, these more advanced approaches to mental health speak about is it, it's not about what you don't have, it's about appreciating what you do have, right? And this is what the journey Phil is on here in this section of the movie, really the whole movie, but really this section of the movie is that he hates everything he does have. Yeah. He doesn't appreciate what he has because the one thing he doesn't have, as you mentioned here a few minutes ago, Steve, is um, is her. And because he can't have her, everything else, since he doesn't appreciate it already, gets even more 
uh, worthless to him. And so it's everything's in reflection because he hates himself. And so he has to find his way to liking himself again by making an active choice or active choices to improve himself. And in improving himself, he likes himself and accepts himself. It's not arrogance or condescension. It's accepting and liking that you're doing something and that's going to make you attractive to the other person, you know? And so, because she's very clearly one of these people that enjoys the world, finds Mm -hmm. joy in the littlest things and likes life. Phil is completely opposite from that because he's super frustrated that he hasn't got the big job, the, the great woman, the... The good money, you know, he's going to Punxsutawney, which he hates. He's got to fight off this dude who wants to take his job, who's telling him he'll, you know, stay in Punxsutawney. I can do extra shows. So people are nipping at the heels for the at his heels for the things that he doesn't even want. But because he doesn't have anything else, even the thing he doesn't want means it means is worth fighting for against someone like that. So it, there's a lot here within his unhappiness that you can unpack. And maybe this is one of the reasons, again, I, you know, one of the reasons uh, that people love this movie so much, because I think a lot of people are um, frustrated with their lives because they're not where they want to be for any number of reasons. And they feel a connection with Phil and there's a hopefulness because Phil does eventually in, as the movie goes on, climb out of it. And maybe that's something that people feel a connection to when they watch this movie, the hope that there's a possibility to climb out of it. I absolutely think so. And I just have one more thought and then yeah, I know we I'm need sorry, to jump back into the film. Soul. No, 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 not at all. The, the, my one thought is I just suddenly uh, went, are there any genuinely mean people who are happy? And I don't mean people who say something mean because they're insensitive or unaware. Yeah. I mean, people that like Phil Connors, who is a mean person, who is not nice. Are there, no. can you be happy and be that way? No, I don't think so. I don't either. I've never, you know, as someone who's had ex- extensive experience on social media, YouTube, and what have you, I, if you can say truly mean shit, that means you're not a, you're not a happy person in your life at that time. Like, I know for me, some of those stuff, the most vitriolic stuff I said in my past, in my 20s and 30s, and uh, maybe early 40s, uh, was born from the place of being unhappy or unsatisfied. And I know doing the therapy in 2016 and into 2018 and all of that, it was essential for me. And I'm still not, you know, hundred percent happy because I have goals I want to achieve in life, but like, there's no way I would have any level of happiness that I do now if it wasn't for therapy waking me up to those things. And I'm, um, you know, and that's, that's an important thing. Cause I, I once you understand we're all, cause that meanness is, is really a, um, and I'm just not, I'm trying I'm not trying to excuse everyone who's mean and says the most horrific shit as we were talking earlier uh, off mic but like there are people who say mean things because they want to be seen they want to be heard they yeah. feel irrelevant and they think if I say the meanest thing then I will get that attention someone described it like dopamine and it's a dopamine of int- of attention but like dopamine it also goes away quickly and then you need more of it. So you have to get even angrier and meaner and more um, uh, terrible in your – or toxic, rather, in your um, commentary or your comments on the world. And that's what leads to an unhappy existence, you know, if you don't come to terms with it. The, the one thing we haven't said, or I don't think we've said about Phil, is that he also feels superior to everyone he's around. Well, he thinks – yeah. That's what he thinks. And that, and that is a barrier that he puts up between him and all these people who might actually end up, and this is what he's going to discover. They're all interesting people. But at this moment, he is definitely at a low point and comes up to Rita and says, I've come to the end of me, Rita. There's no way out now. I just want you to remember we had a beautiful day together once. Mm. I love that line because of course she doesn't remember that they had a beautiful day together once, but they actually did. Yeah. You know, uh, and then he steals the groundhog <laughs> and steals the groundhog truck. Yes. And we get uh, what is, you know, the groundhog day's version of a car chase. <laughs> and we cut to Bill Murray driving with the groundhog in his lap, driving the car, multiple moments from the trailer. And it's very funny. Don't drive angry. Don't drive angry. Apparently the groundhog did get angry. Yes. 
And in this, they, you know, the trainer maybe left him in the car with Bill too much and the groundhog was getting more and more stressed and then bit the shit out of Bill Murray's finger. I have a feeling Bill Murray is lying when he tells this story a little bit. I wonder if Bill was, so? was fucking with the groundhog a little bit just to see how far he... Knowing Bill Murray's, what people have commented on Bill Murray's personality, I feel like maybe he might have... And, and as we said earlier, he was unhappy making the movie. So maybe there's a little bit of fill that creeped in in that moment. Well, and, you know, as we discussed at a recent short, yeah. animals can kind of sense your mood. And maybe if he was getting more and more angry and stressed out in the truck, that affected the groundhog. Yeah. You, you got to stay calm around animals, particularly jaguars. So I've heard. <laughs> yes, exactly. And if you want to know what that's about, you're going to have to subscribe on patreon.com slash the cinephiles and hear our latest cinephile short. Bang. Um, but right now we've reached a quarry. They feel like they've got him trapped and they're sort of a stalemate. And then we have Brian Dole Murray, who was part of this car chase, tells the cops. You got to shoot. Aim high. I don't want to hit the groundhog. <laughs> and I wrote down, really? <laughs> I mean, I'm, obviously, I don't think this movie is realistic. But that line is not believable to me at all. <laughs> that they're going to open fire on him with the groundhog in the truck. Yeah. Well, we mustn't keep our public waiting, huh? <laughs> it's showtime, Phil. He floors it. Hard on me, Larry. In three, two, one. And he drives the pickup truck off the cliff. In what I think is a great looking car crash. Yeah. Phil. He might be okay. <laughs> and then it explodes. Well, no, probably not now. So good. And then it's 6 a.m. and he wakes up. This to me is the polar opposite of waking up after jail. Mm, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. jail, it was a test to see that there were no consequences. And he celebrated. Right. I could do anything. And here he... Did, do you think he genuinely wanted to die? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think he would take the, take his life multiple times if he didn't want to actually die. Yeah. And so again, this is a great, like small example of, of the deepest depression of mental health is waking up. I mean, the worst times for me were the first three hours when I woke up for those seven, eight months when I was in that really, really deepest depression. It is the despondency that you are awake and didn't die in the night and that you have to face the day and find a way to get through it and like deal with people, go to your job, um, you know, eat your food, drive home, watch TV, hear from people, text people, You've got to navigate your day. And so every navigate your day and every day you wake up, it's like, ah, oh, fuck, I got to do all this all over again. And also try not to kill myself. Whereas with Phil, it was, I got to wake up and deal with all this, all the feelings. Cause all the feelings come rushing back all over again. Cause while you're asleep, you're not feeling them. But when you wake up, everything's come, comes rushing back. So then what are you going to do? And I imagine what we see here, the montage of Phil doing all these different things to kill himself. Uh, as we said, how many different ways did he come up? with to kill himself before he finally realized what he had to do. Well, and it's just such a horrible, horrible curse that he's mm -hmm. under because like the realization of like, Oh, and I can't even kill myself. Yeah. Like I, uh, <laughs> yes. The ultimate way out is even closed to me in this situation, which means as far as he knows at this moment, I'm here for eternity. Yes. I'm going to live the rest of my life on February 2nd in Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, doing the same, never having a connection that lasts more than a day, seeing the same events, the same weather, the same everything over and over again. And I can't even fucking kill myself. This is Prometheus, right? Oh no. Um, what is it? Sisyphus who has to push the boulder up? Sisyphus is the boulder. Yeah. Yeah. So Prometheus Sisyphus gets his liver eaten every day. That's that was Sisyphus or that was Prometheus. Prometheus is the liver. Sisyphus is the boulder. Yeah. So both those things suck. <laughs> Cause yeah, every day you wake up, you either had your liver taken out or you've got to push this boulder up the hill every day and repeat and repeat and repeat. Then the last one is him jumping off the church and we cut to the morgue where Rita and Larry are identifying the body. And Larry says, he was a really, really great guy. I really, really liked him a lot. 
here's the, again, I had this thought, I think I mentioned it in part one, it's like, what if these are all little mini universes that are mm. being created each day? And so there is a universe where Phil did jump off the church and they identified the body and had to go on, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, I, but then the more I thought about that possibility, the more upsetting to me it came. <laughs> uh, I want to ask you another question. Yeah. So we, obviously things have gotten pretty dark. Mm -hmm. You and I both believe that Phil is here many, 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 many hundreds or even thousands more days than what yeah. we're actually seeing in the film. Yeah. How dark do you think it got with Phil? Oh, well, like, pretty dark. I would say pretty dark. Like yeah. did, he kill, did he kill people? Oh, I don't know if I got that far. No, I don't think he actually did. I, I Because he hates himself. Um, so yeah, cause I don't want to think of him killing Ned cause that would make the most sense. He would kill Ned first. I would imagine. I, I frankly, if we're talking that he was there mm -hmm. for a hundred years, yeah, I think he did a lot of it. A lot of the stuff. Wow. Now you've gone real dark. Do you think he yeah. would have, so you think he would have, see, I don't, I don't know if I necessarily, cause I, we skipped over that. Like, I think after he has sex with everybody. I think that's the next step is, well, let me try out murder. Let's see what that is like. Can I do that? But nothing about him seemed to indicate that he would have that tendency. Right. Um, so I don't know that I would, you know, and obviously, you know, believe what, what you feel. But well, I and it's not in the film. I mean, there's right, nothing in yeah. the film to indicate that anything like that has happened. I just go, yeah. uh, you know, thousands of days, you know, yeah. you know, like one day you wake up and well, I just, I just randomly punched that guy. Well, do you take the chance though? Because like killing yourself is one thing. Because you're like, okay, I'm taking my own life, which I possess in his mind, right? But do you take the chance that if you kill somebody, it is over and you end up in like hell or whatever your vision of the end of it is? Yeah, I don't know. And that gets held against you. Like I don't know. You know, does Phil have any kind of religious beliefs in his uh, over in his construction? I don't know. Well, he's about to talk about kind of a new religion because the next, his next line as we're sitting at the diner is, I'm a god. You're a god. I'm a god. I'm not the god. And it's so interesting because he's, now he's actually talking to Rita. Yeah. And being honest with her. And this is, and I, I kind of went, as he's explaining what's actually going on to Rita, I was like, is this really the first beginnings of Phil ever really being honest with anybody? Yeah, you know? I think so. And I love, by the way, always a good screenwriting note is if you're going to have a scene, just add another person to the scene. I am an immortal. Special today is blueberry waffles. The fact that Robin Duke is there trying to tell, take the order makes the scene better. Yeah. You're not a god. You can take my word for it. This is 12 years of Catholic school talking. I could come back if you're not ready. And she's not believing it. And finally, he starts to... Tell Rita about every single person in the diner. This is Doris. Her brother-in-law, Carl, owns this diner. She's worked here since she was 17. More than anything else in her life, she wants to see Paris before she dies. Oh, boy, what I... And then we see who we've been talking about this whole time, but actually haven't really met, which is that, yes, that is Michael Shannon, a very, very young Michael Shannon in this yeah. movie. I don't think I would have ever recognized it if I hadn't been told that that's who this was. Uh, yeah, no, I, I didn't remember that he was in the movie until people posted pictures and i was like oh that's him yeah and his fiance is hinden walsh who does tons and tons of voiceover yeah she's a very well respected voiceover artist this is debbie kleiser and her fiance fred do i know you they're supposed to be getting married this afternoon but debbie is having second thoughts what lovely ring this is bill he's been a waiter for three years since he left penn state and had to get work he likes the town, he paints toy soldiers, and he's gay. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think it's because of its early 90s in, you know, yeah. Pennsylvania that I think his just happily saying I am is kind of nice. Well, it, but in also the film, I mean, you could argue that you really don't want someone outing you. That's really your own personal business. But yeah. this is the ninth, early 90s version of allyship. So you kind of accept the spirit of where he's he's coming from, even if you may not. 100% agree with him doing it. So, yeah. 
Um, and this is why, as you mentioned, as we mentioned in the first part, like they all had to be sitting there in this diner for all of these scenes because they're all going to be mentioned here, including... And her? Nancy. She works in the dress shop and makes noises like a chipmunk when she gets real excited. Hey! He predicts the tray that's going to fall. <laughs> and finally, Rita says, what about me, Phil? Do you know me too? This is where Bill Murray is so good. Yeah. You like boats, but not the ocean. You go to a lake in the summer with your family up in the mountains. There's a long wooden dock and a boathouse with boards missing from the roof. You're a sucker for French poetry and rhinestones. You're very generous. You're kind to strangers and children. And when you stand in the snow, you look like an angel. Despite all the grumpiness of Bill Murray and despite his sarcasm and despite all of those things that he's so great at and known for, when Bill Murray just decides to be sincere, it really works. Yeah. And this is, again, this is why people point to this movie as why Bill jumped the, to, to the next level to do more dramatic and emotionally vulnerable roles because of what he could deliver here. Scrooge was like the Scrooge finale monologue. It was a sample. And you could say like, okay, this is a one-off, right? He just happened to nail it that day. But this monologue, I think, is the monologue com um, combined with that monologue from Scrooge where you go, okay, this guy really does have the talent to do these kinds of kinds of roles. Let's start looking at this guy for these kinds of roles. Because, yeah, it's a really sweet, honest, and vulnerable monologue, and which yeah. is not easy to do, by the way, to, to yeah. make that believable beyond just, oh, he's really he really likes her. You can tell that this is the opening of the window into understanding – what he's going to need to get about uh, what it takes to to love her and to win her is to pay attention, is to um, value the things about her that maybe she doesn't even know about herself, but he's he notices it. And so it's not about just trying to get her into bed. It's actually enjoying her as a human being and as a person. And those are the things that he is opening the door to or the window to when he's saying these things to her at the diner, which I think is great. Well, and expressing his own vulnerability, mm -hmm. which is what, because he's been lashing out at everybody to yeah. protect himself from ever getting hurt, from ever showing any weakness. And now he's putting vulnerability out there. And I think there's even more vulnerability in the next moment, what he says. Listen, in, in 10 seconds, Larry is going to come through that door and take you away from me. I love that he says, take you away from me. Mm-hmm. Because Larry has come through that door and taken her away over and over and over again. Yeah. And he writes a note. But you can't let him. Larry. Please believe me. You've got to believe me. That's real, real fear and vulnerability. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question, Steve. Yes, sir. Did he kill himself so many times that he finally began to understand how to appreciate life? And the gift of life. So which I, motivates this monologue and this moment that you so you point out so well. Well, as you brought up the stages of grief, he's heading towards acceptance. Mm. He's heading towards, I don't think he's there. Right. But I think he's, because again, you can only have so many cheeseburgers. <laughs> so he went down that road. That didn't help him out. You can't fake your way into love. He went down that road. That didn't work. He can't kill himself he can't end it there's no choice but to continue to live yeah and so now he started to go okay i can't do any of that other stuff maybe maybe there's a way that isn't what maybe by expressing my truth my honesty my vulnerability like those other things yeah. maybe something else can happen you know yeah um and of course larry comes in and says what we've heard him say over and over again you guys ready we better get going if we're going to stay ahead of the weather. And she's looking down at the note. And I think it's beautifully set up because we know what it says on that note. Yeah. Which is he wrote down what Larry says. And so she doesn't go with Larry. Maybe I should spend the rest of the day with you as an objective witness just to see what happens. Gee, this sounds like a science project. Cut to they're back in his room. The last time we were in the room ended in a slap where he yeah. was desperate, desperate to have sex with her before his day ended. And now they're throwing cards into a hat. Have you ever done this, by the way? No, no. My dad used to do it. My dad was good at it. 
I think they're these weird sort of fifties skills, you know, old school, like American skills, like, like pitching pennies. Did you ever pitch pennies? No pitch pennies. No. Yeah. You, 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 whoever, or a dime or a quarter, whoever could throw it, you throw them towards a wall. Oh, whichever's quarter ends up closest to the wall gets to keep everybody else's money. That's a very famous scene in the last dance documentary for the Chicago bulls. Oh, really? Yes. Hit one of his, um, one of the security guards there. It's a very funny scene. He beats Jordan at that, mm. and Jordan wants to challenge him because he's so competitive. I do remember this. Now that you say it. <laughs> and SNL did an incredible skit about it, um, which with Keegan Michael Key playing Michael Jordan of that moment and how competitive Jordan can be. Um, and so, yeah, I remember that's the one of the few times I've ever seen that. And I've never did it. I just yeah, seen I, it in the documentary. I was like, well, that's an interesting game. Yeah. I did it with my dad. He won. <laughs> this is pretty much how that thing's always went with my dad. Be the hat. Come on, go. Be the hat. It would take me a year to get good at this. No, six months, four to five hours a day, and you'd be an expert. I feel like what's starting to happen in this scene mm. is that he's still Phil and still has that sarcastic sense of humor. Yeah. But he's managed to turn it in a way that's for good, that's no longer being mean. It's mm -hmm. still there. He's still, but it's fun, it's positive. Is this what you do with eternity? Now you know. That's not the worst part. What's the worst part? The worst part is that tomorrow you will have forgotten all about this and you'll treat me like a jerk again. No. It's all right. I am a jerk. No, you're not. It doesn't make any difference. I've killed myself so many times. I don't even exist anymore. Oh, this is philosophy. It is the destruction of self. This is Buddhism, right? It is removing yeah. um, the wants and needs of yourself in order to just exist. And so he is just, this is the, the, the destruction of the old Phil. I've killed myself so many times that I don't, what do you say? I don't even exist anymore. Is that what he said? Yeah. yeah, that's it. The Phil that he knew is dead. He is, as you said, in this transition place to acceptance, to becoming a different person. So even it's a, it's a deceptive line, but it says uh, so much. A deceptively simple line that says so much. And yeah, that's the process. As I, you know, again, you know, watching the movie and analyzing it with you, it's like it's fascinating to see all this stuff within it. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think accepting that he was a jerk. Yeah. Is really, really important. Yeah. And it's funny because what he's done, he's now erased himself. I don't even exist anymore. And then he's going to start the rebuilding process. Exactly. That's what's going to happen next. Because, and a part of it is because of what she says. She says, Well, sometimes I wish I had a thousand lifetimes. I don't know, Phil. Maybe it's not a curse. It just depends on how you look at it. <laughs> I do love his response. He goes, Gosh, you're an upbeat lady. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good because it's still Phil is still in there. So. He's still Phil. Yeah, he's still Phil. But but he didn't say that in a way that was mean. Yeah, he, it was funny and sarcastic, but not yeah. mean to her being an upset, uh, uh, an upbeat lady. Yeah, and she's even snuggling with him. You know, as they're sitting on the bed, and she looks over the clock and sees it's just switched to midnight. Oh, I thought you were supposed to disappear, or I was, or something. Not until six. Oh. You rat! <laughs> and she agrees to stay with him because she's still going to try to stay up. And we cut to it's much later and she's fallen or falling asleep. I'm going to take the first part of this line. It's all right. You can fall asleep. I promise I won't touch you. Would Phil of 10,000 lifetimes ago make that promise? No. I think he absolutely wouldn't. And we're, last time we were in this room, he was desperately trying to, to sleep with her to the point where it was getting scary. Right. And now she's literally in the bed with him and he has made the promise that he is not going to make moves on her. Right. But then he says much <laughs> <laughs> because he's still Phil. Still Phil. But will he touch her? No, I don't think so at all. And, and you said the Phil from 10,000 lifetimes ago wouldn't have said it. If the Phil from 10,000 lifetimes ago did say it, she wouldn't have believed him. Yep. This Phil, she believes. Yeah. And again, she's falling asleep. He looks at her for a long time. He says, What I wanted to say was, I think you're the kindest, sweetest, prettiest person 
I've ever met in my life. I think Annie McDowell plays the I'm asleep, not just on the edge of almost hearing this, but not hearing it really, really well. Yeah. And then I think this line is so key to his un- his growing understanding of who he is. I don't deserve someone like you. But if I ever could, I swear I would love you. The first of my life. It, it gets me, man. Yeah. It totally, yeah, it gets me. And by the way, here's how this came about. Apparently, when Bill Murray got married, his wife fell asleep on his wedding night mm. and he talked to her after she was asleep and said the things that he couldn't say when she was awake. Huh. Yeah. And I love that she just wakes up a little bit and asks him what he said. And he says, good night, Rita. <laughs> and he lets her go to sleep, mm-hmm. even though the whole point of this is to stay up, that maybe her staying awake would do something. And he's, it's acceptance. Mm-hmm. He's, he's going to wake up again and she's going to be gone. And that's what it is. Yeah. And that's what happens. He wakes up and he's alone in the bed. He's back to same day again. And then now he shows up at Gobbler's Knob with um, pastries and coffee for Larry and Rita. And his attitude is totally different. Yep. See, I was just talking with Buster Green. He's the head groundhog honcho. And he said, if we set up over here, we might get a better shot. What do you think? Has he ever asked Larry what he thought? No, before? not even remotely. Nope. Yeah. Um, we cut to him reading in the diner, listening to piano music, and he has a thought. And he goes to the house of the piano teacher. Yes, I'd like a piano lesson, please. Oh, okay. I'm with a student now, but if you want to come back tomorrow, I can probably... Well, I kind of want to get started. I could give you $1,000. And I love she brings him in, and the little push that they <laughs> give to the piano student as they push her out the door is great. Still so terrible. Still Phil. Still Phil. Yeah. Well, I, no, but I think that's the piano teacher pushing the student out. No, but Phil. Phil is going in there and causing the situation oh, for yeah. her to be pushed out. So he put his needs above the little girls, but it's a of comedy. So, yeah. I, I, yeah, I think, I think it works out. <laughs> we, he's, he has a very warm Italian greeting to the guy on the stairs. He's learning how to ice sculpture. We're back in the piano lesson where he's, you know, struggling through some scales. Not bad, Mr. Connors. You say this is your first lesson? Yes, but my father was a piano mover, so. <laughs> Apparently, Bill Murray really wor- worked on this piece of music. This is uh, mm-hmm. Rhapsody on a Theme by Paganini, which is Rachmaninoff. It's not by oh, Paganini. That's not easy. Yeah. Rachmaninoff is like the real deal, you know. Yeah. <laughs> then we get another Ned scene, which starts off the same, but now he goes, Thought it was you. Ned Ryerson. <laughs> yeah. Phil gives Ned the biggest hug. I have missed you so much. I don't know where you're headed, but. Can you call in sick? That was a Bill Murray improvises line. <laughs> and, and Ned runs away. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I got to get going. Right, because he has turned the tables on Ned. Ned is, he, Ned, this, Ned is deceptively more intelligent than you think. That's why he's successful at selling insurance. So by, by removing Ned's power in that situation... He unsettles Ned because Phil is not needing of Ned, not desperate for Ned, nothing. He actually m- greets Ned with legitimate emotion and feeling. It throws Ned off and it scares Ned because Ned is on his own, as you said, little mini universe journey himself. Yeah. You, you don't think this is just a early 90s kind of homophobic joke? Him uh, running away? Voice. No, him, him well, running away from the guy that's hugging him. Who I don't think time so. With him. No, because the way Ned's been set up, I I don't think it's a homophobic joke at all. I think it's more a matter of, like, Ned's not comfortable with real emotion himself. And so, you know, nobody who goes, bing, all the time is comfortable with real emotion. I think that's a fair assessment. I think that's, I think that's, like, it's just science. (laughs) The number of times you say bing, (laughs) obviously, you got some stuff going on. (laughs) So we see this older homeless man that we've seen before, and he's not looking good. And so Phil says, let's get you someplace warm. We end up in the hospital. Are you the one who brought the old man in? Mm-hmm. How's he? Well, he just passed away. That is a tough scene. And again, it mirrors a little bit of what you saw in Scrooge, right? Totally. With, uh, I forget the actor's name, something Johnson, and seeing him below and he's like screaming at him, why'd you do that? Why didn't you listen to me? Why didn't you? And he's like, immediately feels like, I need to see the chart. 
Yeah. When we go back there, and I love what she says to him. She says, sometimes people die. You know, it's just like, oh, it's heartbreaking, man. Sometimes people just die. Not today. And then he goes on a mission, which is, you know, again, this is part of his change to go, I'm going to prevent this guy from dying today. Yeah. And we see him in the diner getting some hot food into him. And then we cut to mouth to mouth in the alley because he's still dying. And this is, I wrote down the same thing. I wrote down Scrooge here because I had the same thought. Yeah. And there's this moment, and I'll tell you, you know, I said at the beginning, I hadn't seen the movie in a, in a while, but I really remembered all of it. Mm-hmm. One thing I didn't remember was in my memory, he saved this guy's life. Oh, yeah. And what actually happens is no matter what he does, he cannot save this guy's life. Right. And it's the moment where I thought of, you know, the serenity pair, you know, mm. the, you know, give me the strength to, to change the things I can, the, the courage to accept the things that I can't and the wisdom to know the difference or whatever. I, mean, yeah. I probably didn't say it exactly right, but I feel like this moment where he sees that he can't save this one person is a moment of acceptance about who he is in this universe and what he can change and what he can't change. You know? Right. Well, I mean, <clears throat> a lot of philosophers say that like, you know, you can't, you can't appreciate life until you accept death, that a death is part of life. And so Phil thought, well, in his, because he's still on this journey of acceptance, as you said, and this change within himself. Well, I've got this power. I can save this guy. I know I can save this guy. And in the end, all he can do is help this guy die in a better situation or in a better place that day. But that guy is dying that day, and there's yeah. nothing he can do about it. And that adds to his uh, his ability of understanding what life really means. And I think that's super important too, as we're seeing this change happening to him in this section of the film. I I, I think it's such a critical scene, and I'm going to say this in a weird way, but I think it's a critical scene because you could have cut it out, oh, and if you'd cut it out, then it's just heroic. But with right. this with this scene in there, it's like no life is he's not in fact a god, yeah. and he will not have control over his life, right. not over everything, right. I believe, I don't know what you think, but I think from this moment forward, he's about to do the absolutely beautiful report uh, in front of Punxsutawney Phil. I feel like this is actually one day. I don't think this is multiple days. I think from this point forward, this is his last day. I think it has to be, right? Because it doesn't work as well in the film if this was if this happened over multiple days. Yeah. And he does this beautiful heartfelt speech with everyone in silence all around him because of the profundity of his words about Punxsutawney Phil. But standing here among the people of Punxsutawney and basking in the warmth of their hearths and hearts, I couldn't imagine a better fate than a long and lustrous winter. Deep stuff, John. Mm, Very deep. (laughs) I love that Larry goes, hey man, you touched me. (laughs) Uh, and then this is great. Like Rita is this Rita now is really interested in this film, genuinely interested, which is what he wanted from the very, very beginning. Mm -hmm. Phil, Mm. that was surprising. I didn't know you were so versatile. I surprise myself sometimes. Well, where are you going? Would you like to get a cup of coffee? I'd love to. Can I have a rain check? I've got some errands. I've got to run. Okay. Like he is now so determined to be the person that he wants to be that he's walking away from the thing that he wanted from the beginning. Yeah, because he's put it in the proper context. He cares about her, but she is not the end-all, be-all to his life. So he properly cares about her, which is, I appreciate you, I enjoy who you are, but I also have these other things to do, so let me do these things and and I'll be back and we'll continue whatever we have here. So that's that's the important line that you have to walk sometimes in a successful relationship is that person cannot be the who you see yourself worth through. Exactly. You have to accept that person for who they are and their importance to your life. But if you wrap your self-worth up into that person, then all you've done is transfer your issues onto that person and you make that person your battlefield for your own shit. So I like that this is also a very – totally. <clears throat> The progressive, emotionally progressive approach to his her value in his life. He's look at his watch as he's walking down the street. Now he starts to run down the street because there's the kid in a tree and he's got to catch that kid to save him. What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? You little brat! You have never thanked me. You've never thanked me. 
by the way, this even though the kid was just dropping from a little platform just off screen, it's yeah. still a heavy kid. Sure. And after catching him three or four times, this messed up Bill Murray's back a lot. Oh my gosh. Which you could totally get. Uh, he also, by the way, in the outtakes, he also saved uh, a girl from being hit by a car in the outtakes. In, in real life. Oh, 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 oh. You no, in the outtakes. There was, so there was another scene. <laughs> and I think they rightly realized we really don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> There's a group of uh, older ladies in the car who getting a flat tire and suddenly <laughs> their car lifts up because there is Phil ready to change their tire. He says, yeah. it's nothing, ma'am. I had the tire and the jack. Just be comfortable. All right. Be a minute. We're in a restaurant where uh, Brian Dill Murray starts choking and in comes Phil Heimlich's him. If you're going to eat steak, get some sharper teeth, all right? <laughs> Enjoy your life. And then he's walking out, lights a cigarette for a woman because he's ready for that too. It is so weird seeing uh, smoking in restaurants now. Yeah. Yeah. That was just normal. <laughs> Larry is talking up Nancy. I don't think that's going to work very well. Like he that. creepily invites her into the van. Uh and then Rita comes up and we say we're going to head to the party where, and she says, maybe we should call Phil. Phil Connors? I think he's already in there. Great. And then we hear the piano playing. And of course we know, you know, what we're going to see. This whole sequence is Phil appreciating life and loving life. <clears throat> Whereas he thought these people in the opening of the movie were beneath him, as you said, Steve. Uh, they weren't worth his time. He was above them. Now he is savoring, saving their lives, making their lives more comfortable, helping them out, doing these things, and not for the gratification of helping. It's because he actually cares about them. And that radiates off every single one of his actions. That's Bill Murray acting these little mini scenes out in the montage. And it's so great. He is genuinely, I want to help. Genuinely, I want to, even the giving shit to the kid that you never thank me, that's from a place of ball busting. So it's care. And in that moment with the old ladies, same thing. He cares. Um, and he's in there playing the piano not to impress Rita. It's because he's enjoying entertaining everybody in the room. Yeah. And then Rita will walk into the room and go from there. And even he's kind of surprised to see her. You know? I mean, there are people, and we have been around them, who walk into a room and make the room happier. Yeah. Make the room more joyful. Sure. Make who, people who walk in and you feel, and, and really, you know, my mom is one of these people. Mm. My mom, she, when she walks up to someone and expresses interest in them, that is because she is genuinely interested in just about everybody that she meets and is excited to be there. I'm, because, yeah, I remember that distinctly, Steve. The first time I met your mom, she uh, disarmed me with that genuine, honest interest. It's really moving. To when you experience that kind of energy in real life from someone, you're just like, wow, you actually, because so much of your life is trying to tell people that you matter or trying to show people that you matter. To have someone just automatically accept that you matter is a real unnerving experience initially. So every time I see your mom, I'm always happy to see your mom because she brings that energy every time. And it is not fake. No, I it's not. I guarantee you that she, and she, mm -hmm. uh, it, it's funny. I mean, she's 82. Her memory isn't quite as as like razor sharp as it was, but she pretty much still can. She knows what you're doing. She knows yeah. about Lindley. She knows she remembers every detail. Maybe she's been living the same day over and over again or something <laughs> because I can't remember all the details about people that she does, but she really cares and is very interested in where they're going. And this is the th it's like I think, you know, we could be judged a little bit on like, well, how much you know, if there's a positive and negative, how much joy do you bring the, to the world? Right. How much joy do you bring to the room that you walk into? How much care? How much kindness? How much loving? How much attention can you bring? Because there are other people that walk into a room and they suck the joy right out. Yeah. You know, they walk in with a negative attitude. They're pissed off. They're unhappy. They feel put upon and they make everybody else in the room feel that way. Yeah. You know, 100%. Um, I love that as he's playing the piano, the piano teacher is watching and smiling. And by the way, the, the, a couple, a couple of things about this. So first of all, his whole, like, I just come in for one lesson a day. That doesn't, I mean, there had to be thousands of lessons to get oh, there. Yeah. But like, what did he come up with today? He came in being a great piano player already. Yeah. So her going, being super proud and going, he's my student. It's like, you just met him today. <laughs> you didn't teach him anything. Well, it could be that he pretended as if he didn't know that much. And so that through that day, she taught him. And so she takes a pride that she kind of helped him in some way get to this level or whatever. I don't know. 
So the other thing is that, <clears throat> so you and I, I think both agree that this is his last day and this yeah. all happened in one day. Sure. So did he pay her a thousand dollars today for a piano lesson? Oh, good question. Maybe she Maybe. had to, because otherwise yeah. she wouldn't say he's my student because right. she had never been her student. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he assumes that it's tomorrow. It will be February 2nd again, and there'll be a thousand dollars in his pocket. Right. Right. <laughs> but it's not going to be. Yeah. Yeah. Because this day is for real. This one counts. So that thousand is gone. <laughs> there has to be stakes if you're going to make the change, right? Yeah. So thousand's gone. And, 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 you know, through all this, Rita is looking at him like, what's going on? Because then next, the little old ladies come up to thank him. What was that all about? I really don't know. They've been hitting on me all night. Again, it's that Phil sense of humor, but used in a way that isn't mean. That's yeah. just fun. Yeah. And and then up comes Brian Doyle Murray to thank him for saving their their life. Oh, it's his wife, right? Because Brian is more like You're right, you're right. Yeah. Oh, and then we have our married couple because they went through getting married because of what Phil did, and he gives them tickets. I love that he gives them tickets to WrestleMania. Perfect. <laughs> um, it's a great choice. That's a great screenwriting choice because yeah. it makes them a unique couple. Yeah. Because they 100%. both love WrestleMania. Well, I will say I love the little comedic moment too. Mm. With the actress who play who does all the voiceovers now, when f um, Michael Shannon's character hugs Annie McDowell a little bit too long, and the jealous face on her, the jealous look. Oh on yeah, her face, I love that moment. That's such you. That's such a great throwaway comedic moment, but it says so much. It's such a perfect part of the scene to throw some comedy in there. You reminded me. I probably told this story before, but it's a, but but it's a it's a good directing story, and it comes from I was lucky enough to have classes with Eddie Dimitrik, who was a classic Hollywood director, number of the Hollywood Ten, who directed you know Marilyn Monroe and Spencer Tracy and all those guys, and he was ninety five years old teaching a class at USC, my first year at USC, mm -hmm. and he was crazy and rambled, and sometimes the class just went nowhere but he said some great stuff and this was this was one of his directing notes which i think you'll like as well which is that all right you have let's say you have a scene where there's like movie stars who are showing up at the big premiere or the fancy restaurant or something like that and they pull up the car pulls up to the red carpet doorman opens up the door for the fancy couple they walk out on the carpet and they go inside that's the scene Mm -hmm. And you could do that. And all you got to do is get the couple who are the main characters up the red carpet and into the building. That's yeah. all you got to do. And so this scene is fine. And he said, but what you could do is that the car pulls up, the doorman opens the door for the car. They walk past him. He looks down at the car and he spits on the car. Mm. Or you could do the doorman walks up, opens up the door. They walk past him and he sees a little smudge on the car and he cleans up that smudge on the car. Mm. And it's like, did it change your the doorman's not a main character? It doesn't matter in terms of the movie, but it's one little moment that teaches us a little thing about who the people are in the film. Yeah. And, and that's what I think that moment that you're talking about with Michael Shannon is exactly that. It's not necessary. Right. But it adds one little bit of depth to the characters, you know? Yeah. And I also think it's a good construct within the, within the film, Steve, that this is not all just everyone kissing Phil's ass. Right. You throw a little bit of devilish humor in there to kind of balance the scales quickly as you go from all these people saying how great Phil's been to them throughout the day. Yeah. So now Rita is staring at him just in awe and says, What is going on? I really don't know. No, there is something going on with you. Would you like the long version or the short one? Let's start with the short and go from there. But then he doesn't give her the, any explanation, long or short, because we're about to go into the bachelor auction <laughs> so here's my question john mm -hmm. in the course of this night yes. like between now and the ice sculpture that we're going to see or 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 the stuff that happens later does he ever tell her about being in a loop on this day oh i don't know bud it's a good question let's get to the end of the movie and maybe okay. i'll answer your question when yeah, we get to the end think of the about movie. it as we go yeah but right now we're going to uh, auction people off and Phil's not getting up, but they call him up and say, no, we got to auction. You're our most eligible bachelor. So he goes up there. We get a bidding roar, war between Nancy and Doris that gets up to 60 bucks. And then we hear $339.88. And she takes him out. And then Larry goes up. <laughs> Just one more let's bag on Larry joke where nobody will bid on him. And finally, one of the old ladies <laughs> goes for two bits. 
And it's amazing how the wheels have turned because like, or the, the tables have turned because at the beginning of the movie, it's clear that Larry is the put upon person <clears throat> dealing with Phil's behavior and mistreatment of him, right? But as the movie goes along, Larry doesn't change. Phil changes. Yeah. So Phil is the one that gets up there and gets the nice, and him, Phil's not wanting to go up there. He gets dragged up there legitimately. It isn't a fake like, oh, not me, but please take me. Whereas Larry runs up there because he's trying to impress Nancy, who has just been bidding so much for Phil. So yeah, so that's the difference there. Him wanting the attention versus someone yeah. who is not necessarily seeking it, but you know, taking it because it's for a good cause. And then we hear something we've heard over and over again in the movie, but not in the circumstances we heard it before, which is we hear in the lobby of this place, Phil? <laughs> Phil Connors? And we're like, wait, what's going on? And up comes a very happy Ned because Phil Connors has bought every single possible kind of insurance you possibly could have. Again, same with the thousand bucks. This is his last day. Yeah. Phil Connors is locked into a shit ton of insurance going forward. Yes. Yes. He didn't, th he assumed that he's just stuck here <laughs> so we can buy whatever insurance he wants. And, and I love, I love, and this is one of the key Rita moments, I think, which is that Ned wants to hang out. What are we all going to yeah. do together? Where are we going? Oh, let's not spoil it. <laughs> oh, let's not. Oh, I got that. <laughs> I love that. I love that Tobolowski button on that scene. <laughs> well, well, and I think, and you said this, I think in part one is Rita's got steel in her. Oh yeah. As much as she's super sweet and very positive and likes everyone, she also just went no to no to Ned. We're done with you. Yeah, you know? exactly. Well, I've met this in my life. People who love and enjoy life, as you could probably say about your mom, people who love and enjoy interested in people in life, they also have a line. And yeah. that line is very clear because they are genuinely themselves they are genuine about that as well. And you kind of can't, you kind of respect that when they, when it comes up, you're like, wow, okay, I get it. You know, and Phil does. So we're outside. Phil is carving an ice sculpture. Rita's complaining that it's cold. I'm just trying to give you your money's worth. You paid top dollar for me. Wow. I think you were a bargain. <sighs> Sweet of you to say. You're probably right. Which again, it's that same arrogant sense of humor, but it's not mean anymore yeah. the meanness has all been pulled away come on phil i'm freezing all right now let me turn and play and he turns around this absolutely gorgeous ice sculpture mm. of rita how did you do that i know your face so well i could have done it with my eyes closed so let me ask you the question again now has he told her about the loop or not not yet i think he has i you think really? the only okay. way because this is all again it's just one short day Mm -hmm. And the only way to get her to a, how he could to say a thing, like, I know your face so well, I could mm -hmm. have done it with my eyes closed. Well, how would he know her face so well if he hadn't told her what he's been doing? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That's, that's my feeling. Okay. Uh, of course we don't know, but that's kind of my feeling. Okay. It's lovely. I don't know what to say. I do. No matter what happens tomorrow for the rest of my life i'm happy now because i love you i think he's had to have told her because otherwise saying i love you on this day is really weird it it can be weird but he's being so genuine yeah and he's so loved that maybe she accepts it because as you said and we've we said she's a one of these people that kind of enjoys the experience of life and here's a guy who she had a certain opinion on of in the beginning of the day, but as the day has progressed, the opinion has completely changed, and she's found herself attracted mm -hmm. to him and liking him and genuinely seeing the soul and spirit of him, that him saying, I love you, maybe doesn't come across as creepy to her. It's more like a genuine, I love who you are as a person. And so maybe she took it that way, as opposed to, I love you, I'm a dick, let's get married, blah, blah, blah. It's more like, I love you, like, as a human, who you are. And maybe because it's so genuine, she accepts it. Well, I and, the, and, and I think it's totally fine. I mean, there, there, there's, A, there's no way for us to know, obviously. Yeah, and B, the scene completely works. It's just, I go like, uh, in, in my head canon, yeah, yeah. I feel like he told her. Okay. And then she says, I think I'm happy too. And they kiss. Yeah. And it starts to snow. 
And I think I, I totally made this is totally made up by me. Mm. But there's almost he looks around when it starts to snow, and it almost to me feels like the snow surprised him a little bit. It's a wonderful life moment. The snow comes back. Mm. So 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 that he does subconsciously or whatever go wait something's different yes yes I, so, I think i'm i'm so glad that you felt this that way too and they walk off into the snow and then we cut to what we've cut to over and over and over again which is an alarm clock that says 5 59 and then it clicks over to 6 a.m and what happens but i've got you babe starts <laughs> and i don't know about you but i'm just going no <laughs> And Phil opens his eyes. And if you look closely, I think you see he's not in the blue pajamas. Right. Yes. So, And then we hear them talking and arguing about the song and not playing it again. And, she, and then we see her arm come into frame to go turn off the radio. Yeah. That is so satisfying. <laughs> yes. Very much so. And I love, too, that his choice, as he's looking around, just completely bewildered and shocked is to pinch her <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's, she's real <laughs> something is different good or bad anything different is good so by the way it took 25 takes to do this scene oh they my rewrote God. it over and over and over again because it was really delicate and they had to figure out how to get it just right and i and, and it's funny in general i would say it's not a good plan for the director to poll the cast and crew to make a directorial decision mm. at least not very often but in this case harold ramus did poll the cast and crew to ask this question have they had sex Ooh. and the overwhelming consensus was no mm -hmm. they should not have had sex and they and the, and harold went yes i think that's the right choice mm -hmm. and so that was part of this rewriting process is going like okay exactly where we are what is the situation why are you here I bought you, I own you. But why are you still here? You said stay, so I stayed. Mm. Bang. It's a great line. Yeah. And I also think this is why it's so important that they didn't have sex. Mm -hmm. Is that because you want to you want to take that that was so important to the equation of when he was replaying the day to have the perfect date to end in sex. Taking that out of the equation is what makes this so sweet. And to say that Phil is like over the moon in this moment. <laughs> I gotta check some. Oh, stay, stay. Then he runs the window, opens up the shades, and there is the town covered in snow. They're gone. They're all gone. And this, to me, is you know, you know, he did it all in one day. It's Christmas morning on on Christmas Carol. It's it's yeah. all it's the magical moment of discovery. Do you know what today is? No, what? <laughs> today is tomorrow. It happened. You're here. I'm here. And he's kind of amorous and kisses her, and she says, Phil, why weren't you like this last night? You just fell asleep. <laughs> Which I think is, again, great. Is there anything I can do for you today? Which is who he became is a person who asks about the other person yep. first. Yep. And she says, I can think of something. And they kiss. <laughs> and, and by the way, Part of me kind of wishes the movie ended here, but the next scene is really fun, which is they're coming out of the bed and breakfast and being very romantic. And he says, It's so beautiful. Let's live here. <laughs> we'll rent to start. <laughs> we'll rent to start, of course, is a Bill Murray line. And we hear Nat King Cole's almost like being in love as they climb over the picket fence, which they had to because the latch was frozen solid, so they couldn't open that gate. <laughs> and that is the end of Groundhog Day. Yeah. It premiered on February 4th, not February 2nd, 1993 in Westwood. It opened to good reviews. The next day, there were Hasidic Jews picketing the film in Westwood. What? So this is the so Harold Ramis gets this message. Your film's being picketed. He goes to Westwood and sees they're all holding signs that says, "Are you living the same day over and over again?" It was a supportive picket. No, they were going. This movie has a great message, and so they were holding up signs trying to get people to go see the movie. That's awesome. Yeah, that is so rare, Steve. Yeah, Jesus. yeah. It uh, made one hundred and five million dollars as one of nineteen ninety three's highest grossing films. Bill 
later, although he wasn't positive about the film mm. at the time of its making, later said, I think to Larry King, that he thinks it's the best work that he's ever done mm -hmm. and the best work that Harold Ramis has ever done. Yeah. But this was also the end of their friendship, as you, I think you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah, unfortunately, because all the fights they had on the set, and I think also probably like he attached his divorce feelings to Harold because he was going through the same thing. Uh, he was going through that at the same time as making the movie. And so I think for him, Bill Murray had to unwrap a lot of things that were connected to the movie. Um, and you know, in the end he did repair the relationship with Harold, but when Harold was on his deathbed, so you have to ask like, you know, how motivated was he really to do it if he wasn't, if he hadn't been dying. So, yeah. you know, but it happened. So that's, yeah. that's important. You know, I mean, I think as we said throughout Bill Murray's not always the easiest of people. No. <laughs> yeah. So I'll give you my final thoughts. I've, I've pretty much already given them, I think, which is just. <laughs> It does, like a lot of these movies we talked about, go to a really, really dark place. And then the message is really, really great. And I want to go back to something you said in the first part. Mm. I totally get why this feels like a Christmas movie. I 100% agree. Because it has that same kind of message as It's a Wonderful Life. As, you know, It's about family. It's about making connections. It's about being positive, being a, a force for good in the world. And it's also, I think, and this is, again, something that I really work on with my son, is the attitude you bring into the world has a lot to do with the attitude you get out of the world. Yeah. Is that people who walk around feeling negative about everything, everything's going to seem negative. Yeah. And people who walk around expecting to be pleased and, you know, like even when, and knowing, and it's not that things aren't going to go wrong. I mean, this movie shows a whole bunch of stuff is going to go wrong, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but if you keep the right attitude, you can end up, you know, getting out of Groundhog Day and finding what you really need. I think those are my, those are my final thoughts. Yeah. Mine are just basically, this was a great film to come back and, and reappreciate, man. I mean, every once in a while in our, in our uh, show, we get a chance to, uh, to revisit a film that both of us haven't seen for a bit and really kind of enjoy going bone deep on it and come out of it even more um, appreciative of the movie and the, the humor still hundred percent works. The emotional beats work, the journey that Phil goes on, is so resonant and Bill Murray's performance, Andy McDowell's work in this, Chris Elliott's uh, occasional funny moments, um, all work so well in tandem to have you care about this character. And it's, you know, the universality, as I spoke about earlier, is still one of the biggest reasons I think this film works and resonates with so many people and the genuine honesty in Bill Murray's performance and all those things just work so well in the setting and the message. Cause look, we can be as sarcastic and as cynical as we want in the world, and certainly there's a lot of places to be like that. But I think at the core base of most humans is this desire to be happy, to find love, to find appreciation. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of um, religious people, a lot of philosophers, a lot of people in the mental health section will tell you that uh, the way to do that is to give back. And it's the hardest thing to do because it also means putting your emotions on the line, but I think you also will get the biggest reward. And this film really underlines that as you watch it. And so I think it's an essential film to have in our conversation of the greatest films uh, of the 20th century. And so I'm glad we talked about it, man. It was a lot of fun with you, brother. Me too. Me too. So that's what we think of Groundhog Day. Of course, we'd love your thoughts. Uh, you can visit us on our Facebook page. Just do a search for The Cinephiles. It's Cine underscore files on Twitter. It's The Cinephiles podcast on Instagram. You can subscribe to the show at all the usual places, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, on YouTube, on Google Play, probably a whole bunch of other places. <laughs> uh, just search for The Cinephiles. You can leave your comments on YouTube. And please, if you haven't done so already, a review on Apple Podcasts would be greatly, greatly appreciated. If you want to buy or stream Groundhog Day, along with every other film we've ever reviewed, that's at cinephiles.net. And if you want to reach me, it's SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. John, how would people find you? Oh, yeah. You can always find me at The Roca Says on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok, The Outlaw Nation on Twitch, my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca Says, uh, and my other podcasts, the Geek, uh, the Geek Buddies and the Hot Mic that are out there for you all to subscribe to as well. So I think that's it for this week. We hope that you have a great, great Groundhog Day coming up in February, and we will see you next time for another great film right here on The Cinephiles. <laughs>